Okay, so hi everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all our participants who are joining in from different parts of the globe. And welcome to this first panel for our ECR Research Colloquium. Of course, you all know that my name is Redden and I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Informal Urbanism Research Hub in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. So I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where this event is being hosted, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. This international research colloquium with early career researchers is convened by SEED, or Space for Engagement in Epistemic Diversity, SEED is an initiative within the Imperial Research Hub that provides a safe space to PhD students and ECRs to discuss research findings, epistemological and methodological issues, as well as practical concerns that young scholars face as we conduct our research projects. So for today's panel session titled State and Informality, I'm delighted to be welcoming three wonderful scholars whose research projects focus on urban informality issues in Ghana, Indonesia, and Argentina. Each presenter will speak for 12 minutes. Then we will open the virtual floor to questions and feedback from our participants. So guys, please uh, turn off your camera and put your microphone on mute. And let me now introduce our first presenter, Dr. Ibrahim Yakubo. Dr. Yakubo is currently a lecturer in the Department of Planning at Simon Didong Dombo University of Business and Integrated Development Studies in Wa, Ghana. His research interests include urban development, housing, and the built environment in developing countries. His presentation today is titled Housing Politics and the Nightmares of Spatial Planning in Indigenous Communities, a review of colonial experience in Tamale, Ghana. So I now turn it over to you, Ibrahim. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the SEED ECR Colloquium, Research Colloquium. Yes, uh, as Redden has um, Put it, my uh, that's me, Ibrahim Yaku, working uh, at the University of, um, of Business and Integrated Development Studies. Wow. I'm trying to share my slides and then uh, commence with the presentation straight away. Can can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Great. Yes. Um, as we may all well be aware, the access of global urban population is beginning to experience a full scale turnabout in the direction of the global south. And um, there are calls for us to begin to rethink the way in which governance, uh, sorry, rethink governance and Policy imperative, which is required to make cities more inclusive and more assuring of prosperity for the generality of urban residents. But in many parts of the global south, what is common is that the agenda to build inclusive cities and make cities more inclusive uh, is mediated by the stagnating effect of um, colonial urban planning policies or decisions. And um, this suggests that if you want to make cities more inclusive, then there's need for us to begin to tailor urban research towards understanding the structural uh, uh, structural forces or challenges which mediate urban transformation experiences in developing countries. And so this study uh, reviews secondary data and archival materials to be able to profile the colonial planning experiences in Tamale and then demonstrate the way in which the activity of planning threatened access to housing for the poor and continue to nurture insurgent practices in, indigenous, in the indigenous housing sector. 
Yeah, this is the map of Tamale um, showing, the, I have a, a map of Ghana showing uh, the Tamale area. Tamale itself is like a British construct, which in 1907 only comprised of a cluster of villages of about 1,435 people. And uh, the, the impetus for the transformation of the town from a village cluster to a town um, was when the colonial authorities decided to establish the administrative headquarters in the area. Uh, and then so, less than, less than a decade after that, Tamale began to experience major urban transformation and it became a very vibrant urban center in the Northern Territories of Ghana. The Northern Territories um, is the upper part of, 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 of Ghana, the Northern side of Ghana, which was um, uh, 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 where the colonial authorities began, uh, you know, decided to set up their administrative headquarters. And Tamale was one of the, was, 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 was the administrative headquarters in the Northern Territory. So after the uh, establishment of this administrative authority, it became a very vibrant town. And then it became more diverse because people began to flow in from other neighboring countries to do business. So the changing demographic profile and then the economic character of the city was soon to experience a heightened, heightened tension between modernist planning ideals and the housing rights of many of the indigenous people who were resident in there. To demonstrate this, we'll talk about the colonial uh, housing politics and then the planning agendas. So the, 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 the framework for urban development and the colonialism was one of colo um, residential segregation, where there was a clear cut split between European areas and indigenous African communities. In the European areas, one will find that those areas were typically well planned and serviced, and they benefited from the enforcement of health and building regulations. But the, uh, by contrast, you will find that the indigenous residential areas were devoid of rational planning and cluttered with numerous environmental problems. Houses were built with non-durable materials and in line with traditions and convenience. What happened was that official intervention in the housing sector, especially in the, uh, uh, in the indigenous housing sector, was likely uh, very much predicated on the colonial, I mean, the expedient consideration by the colonial authorities. Sometimes the fear of the outbreak of epidemics were the major motivation for the extension of planning services to the indigenous, indigenous sections. But in Tamale, it was discovered that uh, part of the motivation for the extension of planning services to the indigenous areas was uh, the, the commercial interests, commercial interests of the colonial states. Um, we, we have enough evidence to suggest that um, the, the first attempts so or the early attempts to rationalize the spatial structure of Tamale beyond the European quarters was inspired by the need to mobilize revenue to finance the activities of the colonial states. They prepared layout for the indigenous areas to grant leases to households and businesses. And then to encourage rent payment, what they did was that native areas or where the indigenous people were staying, they paid less rent, pepecon rent, and then the, 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 the uh, non-native areas were paid, were charged economic rent. But if you were paying pepecon rent, what it meant was that you could also easily be relocated from, from, from where you were staying, uh, depending on the interest or the need of the colonial uh, authority. So they only needed to give you uh, three months of uh, prior notification before you'll be asked to relocate. So all those who were paying perpetual rents, that's the indigenous people, could easily be moved about, be relocated from one area to another. And we found that um, efforts to extend planning services to indigenous sections of Tamale created a great deal of housing demolitions and displacement in the indigenous section. And to minimize the trauma, what the colonial authorities did was to make sure that they provided alternative lands for people to move into, and then they gave them minimal compensation to be able to, to allow them to be able to build uh, uh, new houses and be able to stay in. This benign process of redevelopment uh, completely marks the commercial interests and logic of the colonial states, and as well as the exclusionary tendencies which characterize uh, colonial urban development programs in the city. The smooth process 
of involuntary uh, relocation was made possible by the active involvement of traditional authorities in colonial urban development uh, programs. Traditional authorities played a major part. And in Tamale, it was known that they became major, they, they fronted the revenue mobilization efforts of the, of the colonial authority. And they benefited too, because uh, from archives, we realized that up to 50% of all proceeds which were accruing to the colonial states as a, by way of land rent was uh, paid to native treasury, which was managed by the traditional authority. So the economic and commercial uh, motives underlying urban development programs of the colonial states became manifest when they decided to, uh, uh, when they reached a decision to forcibly relocate re residents of the oldest part of, of, of Tamale, which is Ward D. In the map that you see to your right, you will find the green spots is, is what is referred to as Ward D. That's where Ward D extending toward E and then Ward F were all inhabited by the indigenous population. The houses there were quite traditional. And then so they, but this location was also very central to, uh, it was also at the heart of the town. So the colonial authorities thought that it was proper to redevelop, redesign this area and make it look like the shop front for, for Tamale. But this was also the, 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 uh, the settlement which had been inhabited for several decades before the coming of colonial area, so uh, colonial authorities. So they, 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 the residents held this place in high esteem. It was like a cultural hub. And so the commercial, the, the, the colonial, colonial authorities saw it as a potential commercial development, developed a commercially developed area, which they wanted to replan and uh, give allocation to businesses to be able to settle. But when they started, they completed the plan and then started to discuss that with the people. And then they began to mobilize, to speak and uh, uh, assert strongly against the redevelopment exercise. So when they did, they wrote a strong position led by the Imam of the area, wrote, wrote a very strong position to the colonial authorities. And it reads this way. We the undersigned elders residing in Ward D, Northern Territories of Tamale, humbly and respectfully, bear to forward these our grievances to you for, for, for your kind consideration. Last Monday, we were called by your lordship and you informed us that most of our houses in Ward D will soon be demolished and mm -hmm. our plots will be given to aliens to build stores. We beg to state that most of the houses on the ward were built by our forefathers before the white man came. He came as a friend, but not as a conqueror. He came to build and not to destroy. The buildings are sacred and too dear to be demolished. If our plots will be used by government to build post office, treasuries, hospitals, or, so or schools, which will be beneficial to our country, will be, it will be welcome. But as it is now, government is driving us away for our, from our forefathers' land, uh, for, from our forefathers' soil, and giving it out to aliens to build stores. This is unpleasant to us, and we hope that uh, the district commissioner will reconsider it. So they sent this petition to the colonial authority, and soon after that, it, yeah, they, they sent this petition to the colonial authority, and then it, it triggered some level of conversation. So the, the, the colonial authority decided to kind of re-engage them again, first by trying to change the terms and conditions for relocation so that, for example, they wanted to prevent all those who will be moved from that area um, from, from a, a payment of ground rent. And that's when, when they, their meetings realized, when they realized that the people were not compromising, then they decided to issue stern warning notices and then giving them direction that they were likely to consider, uh, come and then demolish the, the, forcefully demolish the area if they, 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 they decide to, uh, to not move out. But, but still, the people were still resistant to whatever proposals that they were coming up with. So at, a, at, at some point, when they realized that the imam of the area was the one leading the, 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 the uh, uh, protest against the relocation, the colonial authority decided to compromise him. They decided to compromise him 
by proposing to him that they were going to give him a, a, a plot, in the new layout which was to be prepared, and in return, he was going to publicly approve the scheme which was to be proposed, which was proposed. So that seemed to have weakened the, 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 the front of the community people. And so they, it gave the colonial authorities the chance to now issue another deadline for relocation, which was supposed to be uh, uh, 31st March 1950. But by September of 1949, they, they were supposed to replan another area to move the people from the, in, uh, the core area to relocate them. Because the plan was that it was not possible to move them from a slum area to relocate them to, or to create another slum at the, at the peripheries of the town. So, but by six months after, six months after issuing the, uh, 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 six months to the deadline in September of 1949, they realized that uh, nothing had been done by way of replanning or service provision in the world where they were going to be, uh, the, where the people were to be relocated. So by 31st March, the people survived that deadline. Line. And it seemed that government, it seemed that government had forgotten about the project until in 1952, when they started to issue another warning notices. But this time, the imam of the area was compromised already. So another uh, uh, Muslim cleric emerged from the area to lead the people again against the protest. So they, they wrote another strong petition, but this time we copied even the traditional authorities which were in that area. They say, much we appreciate the improvement of Tamale, but we feel that it is not just for government to ask its people to, to, to leave their homes uh, to where we know not, for another group of people to come to occupy the very spot. Here, I must point out that the land is traditionally owned by the people, and that any action that is taken to deprive them of the land will be taken seriously. Among other things, the northerners feel he should be at, the, at, at, at home, even though he may fare well in another part of the country. He finds it a disgrace to leave his father's house to go to ruins. We will be committing ourselves to this very charge if we are allowed, if we are to allow ourselves to be driven out of the, our homes, out of the homes of our ancestors. We shall have no occasion to complain whenever any authority comes out with the intention to lay out this section of the town for the rightful people. But we shall take a serious view should that authority or any group of persons demand our wholesale evacuation of this place. This petition which was sent to the colonial authorities and copied to the traditional authorities may have kind of intimidated the colonial authorities and they rescinded the decision to relocate them from that part of the town. They rescinded and they cited challenges of planning, challenges of resettlement as the reason for abandoning the project. But as at, this, at the time that they were, um, there was that heated tension at the relocation, uh, in the attempt to relocate Ward D, the district engineer in Tamale also was against the relocation for technical reasons. His reason was that the town had already, I mean, the water supply system in the city had reached a threshold where they needed to make new investment in water uh, supplies. And so they were not supposed, they were not prepared to extend the, to make any further extension of the, the city's uh, layout. So that they plan to, I mean, prepare a new layout and relocate the water residents of OD to that area became uh, very difficult. When the district commissioner Roots directing that the engineer should um, try to, to, to pr prepare a new layout. He wrote that I will suggest that the water supply situation in relation to existing and probable future needs of Tamale ought to be examined as a single problem. And I feel that this ought to be done before any extension, ex extensive additions are made to the layout. It seems clear that the layout now contemplated cannot be supplied from the main reservoir. This point came up when we were considering extending the layout south of Tamale about nine months ago, and the water supply people uh, indicated that it was difficult to, to, uh, to be done. It was difficult to, to, to get that, that, that done. So the challenges of, I mean, uh, planning uh, the new site where the were, yes. Uh, I think your 
out of sound. So can you wrap okay. up? Yes. So the, the, the other case, the second case was um, when they decided to rebuild the uh, another village called the Salamba village. That here, this was to make, meant to kind of construct, provide a, a new water supply system. And so the resident comply with the decision to relocate. They, they, so they, you know, there wasn't any um, contestation in this area. The layout was quickly prepared, and then the uh, uh, the district command, uh, you know, district commissioner directed that the allocations should be given to the, the family. So when the allocations were done, just less than seven days after the, 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 the allocations were issued, the people moved into the new site and started building their own style without recourse to the layout which was prepared. And then at that point, they reported the matter to the district authority, and then they ordered for the uh, discontinuation of construction activities at the new site and proposed that they were going to demolish all compounds which were, which were built. But the regional commissioner ruled against that and said that uh, the people were to be blamed the same as much as the, the, the people who were supposed to supervise them for not, not, not taking steps to, I mean, prevent, prevent the, the uh, uh, irregular development which had occurred there. So he proposed that the people should, um, I mean, suspend, they should allow them to continue to build, but they should issue a notice, a letter giving, telling them that um, even if they build now and that the town boundary expands to catch up with the new relocation site, all those who, whose houses did not align with the built area, with the, with the plan, were supposed to be demolished and they will be demolished without recourse to any compensation, without any compensation. So what happened was that this issue, this letter was served on the chief and on many other uh, traditional authorities in the area. And it became the basis. It prevented the demolition of the uh, new settlement, but it also created a basis on which the colonial authority now moved about. I mean, it created the basis for the district authority in present day Tamale to use and be able to uh, 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 just unnecessarily demolish people's houses and using that, that letter uh, you know, as, as, as reference or basis for uh, not compensating them in any way. So um, I think um, the point is that the way the colonial authorities were planning, moving people from one place to the other, and without recourse to a comprehensive structure plan for the area, it is said that they created a network of suburbs which were not properly, spatially, which were not uh, properly integrated. And so, in present-day Tamale, if anyone is to provide infrastructure, you will not do so without pulling down people's homes. And so, there's a lot of contestation here and there, every now and then, whenever government is to. Uh, pro provide a, a, a meaningful infrastructure in any of the informal or uh, traditional or uh, I mean uh, indigenous settlements in the city. So the point is that, yeah, if you want to make cities more inclusive, we need to really understand the history uh, because today you want to make the city a bit modern, inject infrastructure into areas which are not very accessible, but yet you cannot do so without pulling down people's homes and leaving them uh, sweeping them out of the city space. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ibrahim. Let yeah. me now go straight to our second presenter, Masa Mesgar. Uh, Masa is a PhD researcher at Monash University and an urban planner with a track record of working on upgrading projects in the Middle East, Indonesia, and Fiji. Her research explores spatial and land tenure complexities of infrastructure upgrading in informal settlements. Her presentation focuses on infrastructure provision in informal settlements, the challenges and opportunities for co-production of infrastructure in Makassar, Indonesia. So over to you, Masa. Thanks, Raden, uh, and also thank you and thanks um, to uh, Infer for organizing this session. Uh, so um, let me just uh, begin. Okay, um, you can see my screen, yes? 
Yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, as you mentioned, um, uh, Redden, uh, in my research, I explore a spatial and land tenure complexities of infrastructure upgrade in informal sediments. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, uh, a case study um, uh, of an ongoing upgrading pro uh, program in the city of Makassar, located in eastern Indonesia. I will first describe uh, the process of co-production of public services in the city before presenting the case study. Uh, so, uh, what is the problem? Um, where uh, the regulated and upfront provision of basic services such as water supply and sanitation infrastructure doesn't exist, these services have to be retrofitted afterwards into unplanned and dense conditions. This is a particular challenge for informal sediments uh, due to the complex nature of uh, informal tenure arrangements, uh, arrangements which represent a different operational context for uh, the local government agencies. The second challenge is a lack of publicly owned land for the services. Uh, the fluid boundaries in um, between public and uh, private spaces in informal sediments uh, present the opportunity for spatial exchanges in response to everyday needs of the residents, such as creating a space for roads. Um, however, the, uh, these exchanges um, actually, um, the, the publicness of the space in that way um, cannot make it necessarily available for the public infrastructure. And uh, there are other uh, subtle and often uh, invisible boundaries uh, which must be taken into consideration. Um, and uh, the focus of uh, current presentation is on uh, those ownership and use boundaries that impact the infrastructure provision. Uh, for sanitation infrastructure provision, uh, the land is a substantial challenge and any physical intervention has to uh, simultaneously safeguard the claim rights, prevent conflict and secure available and sufficient space for infrastructure. In Makassar, uh, local government agencies only deliver the sanitation infrastructure on the public land to avoid any legal uncertainties associated with informal land tenure arrangements and to ensure the, inf uh, the infrastructure can be registered by Department of Public Work. There are three main um, uh, strategies for acquiring land for infrastructure. Uh, the first one is self-organized land donation, which is the most common approach uh, in the area. Uh, the second in land, uh, is land acquisition through the compensation. And uh, the last one is um, the land provided by the government, which actually is a really a small share comparing to the other approaches. This approach to land acquisition is faced with many difficulties such as long and costly and complex processes involved in land registration for land registration. Uh, and also this indicates a narrow operational context for co-production of the services in Makassar. Now uh, I'm going to um, take uh, you through the result of the case study uh, that I did for this city. Uh, what I'm going to present is showing how different actors, community members actually, with different land tenure arrangements and various levels of tenure security, uh, respond, collaborate, and contribute land where alternative land utilization strategies are proposed, uh, the ones that actually can safeguard the community rights over the land. Um, as a part of my PhD, I have had this uh, wonderful opportunity to be a part of the uh, Royce program, which is an, uh, which is an ongoing uh, operating project in uh, 24 informal sediments uh, across Makassar and uh, uh, in Indonesia and Suva in Fiji. This enabled me to ask those hard and sensitive um, questions around the land tenure and tenure security that perhaps without being a part of this project, I couldn't ask. Uh, revitalizing informal settlements and the environment um, 
RISE uh, is an action-oriented program working with communities, local government, and local stakeholders to co-design location-specific solutions for sanitation infrastructure and provide research-based evidence that a localized water-sensitive approach to revitalizing informal sediments can deliver sustainable, cost-effective health and environmental improvements. As you can see in this figure, uh, the infrastructure provision model in this project consists of uh, individual components such as uh, toilets and also shared components. Uh, and uh, this shared infrastructure are characterized as demanding more space and having a higher impact on the land use. One example of that uh, is uh, wastewater treatment plants. These um, shared elements uh, are actually shared with a servicing group or a cluster uh, that are formed based on the social consideration along with uh, spatial proximities. The focus of my research is um, on the location choice and land utilization strategies for these land hungry elements. Uh, where the private land is needed in this project, uh, there are some uh, strategies that are proposed uh, in order to safeguard the existing rights, both ownership rights and also use rights over the space, and avoid the transfer of ownership rights to the government. These strategies include uh, land, util uh, land use contribution under Hokpokai Agreement uh, and a land lease, um, which is for a duration of 10 years. Uh, these legally acceptable tenure arrangements um, exist in the context uh, and are an example of their, root, uh, their adoption for, uh, their adoption, uh, for um, public functions such as the schools. However, uh, such legal arrangements have been less common in the context of community scale sanitation programs. So now the question is, with having these utilization strategies, is there any correlation between the legality of tenure arrangements and the perceived tenure security and the efficacy of and influence of land contribution from households? Uh, before uh, going through the case study, um, I should uh, introduce um, um, a tenure risk spectrum that is uh, developed through my research. The uncertainties in tenure arrangements for the land acquisition is greatly increased in the absence of land records, insufficient documentation of informal transactions, and informal demarcation of boundaries between the land records and on the ground. In order to move beyond those legal, uh, illegal uh, dichotomy, I uh, have proposed a tenure risk spectrum, as you can see in this figure in my research, um, uh, which um, classifies uh, different uh, levels of legality and uh, or uncertainties in tenure arrangements into five groups from those uh, with uh, the a very low level of tenure uncertainties to those with greater uh, tenure uncertainties for land acquisition. Uh, this is also uh, this um, risk, uh, risk uh, uh, spectrum is supported through interviews with local experts, including public notaries and representatives from local operating programs in Makassar, such as uh, PNPM, um, Kotaku, and US second and USB program, and uh, Pamsimas. Uh, through using uh, this. Um, spectrum of tenure uncertainties, I have been able to observe, so observe some of the patterns in households uh, uh, land contribution. Um, for example, in these figures, uh, I ask how the perceived fear of forced eviction is related to land tenure arrangements and how tenure uncertainties uh, can impact the land contribution from households. As you can see from uh, the uh, first row, uh, mm, the household with different tenure arrangements express a relatively similar level of concerns about uh, being forced to relocate in uh, some of the um, mm, some of these uh, settlements. Uh, for these households, where the perceived fear of forced eviction is high, lower level of contribution is observed. 
Generally, based on this observation, for those households with lower tenure security, the contribution are mostly limited to, do, to those spaces that are already shared under the previously granted use rights. For example, those spaces that are dedicated uh, for informal pathways. However, the land contribution pattern observed in this settlement, uh, which you can see on the second row, uh, is um, not uh, following a consistent pattern. And there are a few cases that the household who express greater concern about the post eviction and those that do not have legal tenure arrangement still contributed land for the shared infrastructure. This may show that where the safeguarding uh, the ownership rights uh, is an option, households may be willing to contribute land to receive uh, infrastructure. Uh, the other question that I ask in my uh, in uh, here, as you can see in this figure, is that um, how the length of a staying in the same settlement is related to the land tenure arrangements and also the pattern of land contribution for households. As you can see in these figures, uh, the duration of living in the same settlement is not necessarily associated with having higher legitimacy and legality of um, tenure and having um, better um, actually uh, uh, tenure status. Uh, but in most of the cases, the land contribution from households for the shared infrastructure is significantly linked uh, to the duration of living in the same settlements. And uh, for example, those who live for more than 10 years or for their whole life contributed the most. Uh, but uh, still, uh, this pattern is not consistent and there are also evidence uh, of land contribution from those who lived uh, less than five years in the settlements. Um, Finally, uh, it seems that uh, where different tenure arrangements coexist in one cluster, one servicing cluster, which consists of a couple of households, and therefore the cluster is less coherent in terms of the land tenure uncertainties, the land contribution tend to be mostly from those households that do not have uh, legal uh, tenure arrangements. Uh, Generally, the result of this case study support the previous research that is um, um, saying and suggesting that de facto uh, tenure security um, is the major player uh, in uh, the household investment uh, collaboration and contribution to the co-production of infrastructure. However, for those patterns that are observed, um, here, one likely explanation can be that um, in the areas that despite the high level of tenure uncertainties and um, higher level of perceived fear of forced eviction, um, maybe receiving infrastructure from the public authorities uh, can be regarded as an indication of approval from the government uh, for the legality and legitimacy of their tenure. Um, I'm going to conclude this presentation by highlighting uh, uh, this fact that the overall feasibility of co-production of services through uh, adapting uh, the proposed land utilization strategies depend on different interrelated and often unmeasurable factors. For example, the willingness of households to contribute and um, the family ties or the relation uh, with the other community members. Any unsettled uh, land conflict uh, in the settlement can also in impact the, uh, the pattern of land contribution from uh, the households and from different land tenure arrangements. Um, and also external dynamics such as those exist in the precinct level uh, can impact the land contribution. An example of this is existing opportunities for selling the land to the developer in the neighboring area or threats of losing their land. Uh, community background and also socio, uh, socioeconomic consideration can also uh, have, an, uh, have a great impact. Therefore, I'm not claiming that this uh, evaluation is comprehensive and um, it's just an observation of the pattern of uh, tenure uncertainties and how people contribute land uh, for the shared infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Masa. I could only I could already see some uh, findings from the two previous presentations resonating with some of the findings of other seed members. So I'm sure the open discussion will be very exciting. So let me now go to our final speaker.
Francesca Perlica. So Francesca is a PhD fellow in regional planning and public policy at the University of Venice. Her research interest lies in the formal, informal nexus in the housing policies for the informal city in the Latin American context, particularly in Buenos Aires metropolitan area. Today, she's going to talk about the collective action and urban planning strategies in the informal housing co-production, learning from peripheral urbanization in Buenos Aires metropolitan area. So Francesca, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just trying to, let me see, I, here we go. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Redden, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to participate. Um, well, as um, Redden already said, I'm, I'm, I'm in Argentina at the moment and I'm doing my fieldwork activities. And, um, and during my fieldwork, I, um, I reshape the, my research questions um, and uh, starting to, to, to do fieldwork in, in Guernica, which is uh, the case study I'm showing to you today. And in this presentation, I will analyze the collective action developed in the, this recent process of occupation of a peri-urban land uh, in the south of great, uh, Greater Buenos Aires in the informal, informal establishment of a residential neighborhood. And I will briefly reconstruct the genesis and the process of the, this land taking and analyzing the interaction between these, the whole stakeholders involved among them, the inhabitants, the local and provincial government, the justice, the police, the social movement, and the economic sectors. Basically, since July 2020, about 90 attempts of land takings have been registered in Argentina in the areas of Greater Buenos Aires and La Plata, concentrately mainly in the outskirts of the metropolitan area. These land invasions, known in the local context as Tomas de Tierra, are shaped as housing responses by popular sector, the struggle with situation of extreme labor and economic precariousness, and as a result of the government lockdown measure and the socioeconomic crisis triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic, they could not afford to pay rent anymore. And so basically they decide to occupy this vacant land. In this case, the Guernica case, uh, 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 in, in this case, about 2,500 2, families settled this, in this vacant property. And as I mentioned, Guernica is not the only, the only case of this land invasion, but it's maybe the most, was maybe the largest and the most emblematic and the one that received the most media attention. Uh, I think that Guernica in somehow is the emblem of how the lack of housing of urban policy in a broad sense end up, end up leaving land invasion as the only al alternative for the popular sectors. Basically, popular sectors are faced with a market that is not interested in their demand and uh, the insufficiency of housing poli policies. So basically what happened here is that politics end up being to allow vacant land to be occupied and to act later with cheaper measure. Cheaper because in Buenos Aires, uh, regularization policies have leaned on the dominant um, dimension of the problem, which is the land title and regularization, without allocating resources for the provision of infrastructure and services. The great media resonance of this case um, played a very important role. Guernica was installed as an exemplification of the economic crisis due to the restrictive measure of the COVID pandemic and also showed the quantitative housing deficit. The media tended to exacerbate the illegal character by defining the inhabitants as usurpers. But also it's important to state that little by little, little our counter information was generated through a draw from the same inhabitants. For example, they created a page that was uh, a Facebook page that was called Tierra para Vivir, Land to Live to narrate their own history from the inside. 
Um, this, this land invasion um, was um, located in the municipality of Presidente Perón, which is the one in red here, in the south of Greater Buenos Aires. This municipality has a population of uh, um, 60,000 inhabitants and its capital city is Guernica, which is basically lo located uh, 38 kilometers from Buenos Aires. And, and it's connected to, to Buenos Aires with, from this uh, railway, which is the Roca, Roca Railway. And uh, as you can see, it's located in what is the third crown of Buenos Aires metropolitan area. The, um, this in this municipality, the urban planning code uh, allocates a large part of the available land to large enterprises and specifically to the construction of gated communities in a tacit agreement with large investors. So the areas here in yellow are defined by the local urban planning regulation as extra urban residential and the code speaks specifically of gated community reserving the vacant land, almost the 30% of the vacant land to these investments. And also here in red, you can see the uh, Presidente Peron motorway, which is currently under construction. And this highway will radically change the accessibility condition of this, uh, this sector, um, allowing the proliferation of new gated communities. Um, the, this is a map of, the, um, of what, what was the occupation, because the occupation was uh, evicted in October. Um, this occupation was supported by, as I said, 2,500 families, mostly migrants from neighboring countries, Bolivia and also Paraguay, uh, whose right to this housing is systematically denied. Um, the neighborhood self-managed by the by the inhabitants was organized in four areas the 20 de julio union la lucha e san martin it is important to note that around the occupation there are four neighborhoods in yellow recognized by the national survey of popular neighborhoods the occupation consisted of about 98 hectares a part of the land this one um, was uh, owned by a signature uh, dedicated to real investment developments with pl plan to construct their uh, gated community. Here you can see that half of the project already started. And the rest of uh, the occupation, these this two um, neighborhoods, uh, were located on uh, uh, land owned by small scale owners, but Actually, the problem was that none of them was able to demonstrate reliable, reliable ownership of the land through the corresponding documentation. And this is an image of um, the San Siran Rugby, Rugby Club, which is the, the community, the gated community project that was going to be installed in the land. Um, as I, as I said, um, the media exacerbate the uh, illegal character of this uh, um, land invasion. And, um, and it's important to state that in, in Argentinian law, the crime of usurpation falls under criminal law, despite the fact that uh, there is both a national constitution and an international agreement that guarantee the right to housing. So what happened here was that the, the the, this specific uh, land invasion uh, was uh, ju judicialized and, um, and uh, a, a judge intervened in the, in the, in the conflict, uh, stating the, the eviction. Also, the local authorities, uh, the response from the local authorities and particularly from the major of uh, the municipality, Presidente Perón, has been very violent and contrary to the occupation. On September 2, all the Peronist major of the third electoral section, which is in the south of uh, Buenos Aires, met in the municipality to establish a firm position against low land invasions. And uh, they asked for a meeting with the provincial governor 
of, Buenos Aires, of the province of Buenos Aires and stated, we strongly condemn the illegal occupation of land and houses. It is a crime and as such, the justice must intervene to enforce the law. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the neighbors organized the, the urbanization through delegates of blocks and assembly to organize the distribution of the lots to each family, organize food delivery and organize daily life in the takings. They also create a feminist assembly to face the problem of gender violence that many of the women of the takings have experienced. Neighbors are divided also, divided themselves into commission of different sectors, such as the commission of urbanism, urbanism the commission of health, the commission of childhood, among others. <clears throat> um, as regarded to the urbanization project, the characteristic of the, um, this uh, land invasion is basically to distinguish themselves from the chaotic and disorderly uh, vicious, which are located in, uh, in the center of um, Buenos Aires. And so the, the land invaders, the, the inhabitants in this case, um, organized the, 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 the occupation, uh, trying to respect the, the provincial law and trying to uh, uh, respect the existing plot, the, the width of the street to allow the entrance of services, infrastructure and transportation in the future. They also foresee spaces for squares and equipment. And this is why, where my technical contribution came into play, because together with a geographer colleague, we began to provide technical assistance by helping the neighbors um, through a project that served as a tool for organization and, and, for order, and for order in some way. So we also advised them on provincial regulation in relation to minimum street width, block width, and with them, we replot the land following the project. And this is, was very, a very interesting experience of interaction between technical knowledge and popular knowledge. Uh, as you can see, the inhabitants have marked out the, the blocks and internal lots with wooden pool and wire, and have built precarious housing, houses of sheet metal, plastic sheets, car cardboard and wood. Uh, the, the, these materials were basically the one that protected the hundreds of families, with some, also with small children, from the frost and from the rain uh, in, during the Argentinian winter. And furthermore, to aggravate the situation, uh, it, might, it must be pointed out that these families did not have access to water, gas and electricity and where present, uh, it was informal and precarious, and so um, presented a, a highly risk. Um, in a second moment, uh, since the demand for technical assistance from the neighbors widened, we decided to form a urban planning advisory commission made up of architects and geographer from the University of Buenos Aires and the University of La Plata, and we elaborated a proposal for, for, for urbanization. Uh, in this project, we proposed the creation of uh, um, one, um, 145 blocks neighborhood that included public spaces, facility, riverside walk, and could basically accommodate 2,500 families. The urbanization proposal was based on the tool uh, of, a, um, of a law, which is called the Law of Fair Access to Housing, uh, approved in November 2020, and that provided the framework for addressing land and housing problems in the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, meanwhile, the state responses where on the one hand, the harsh reaction of the local power, as I showed you before, which installed the police all around the plot, the land. And on the other hand, uh, the government of Buenos Aires opened a dialogue table with the social organization and with the inhabitants to carry out a census before the second ev eviction planned in September and trying to find a peaceful solution to the eviction. Um, but finally, what happened is that in, uh, in the 29th of October, after almost uh, 
uh, 100 days, the negotiation between the provincial authorities and the, and the inhabitants failed. And in view of the justice re uh, rejection of a new request for an extension, the Buenos Aires Ministry of Security carried out a violent eviction with the participation of uh, special forces. And at the moment, the families are um, uh, in, in, a, in, in a very complicated situation. Some of them are homeless. Uh, some of them uh, found uh, uh, are hosted in temporary houses uh, provided by the government. And some of them came back to their uh, informal rent uh, or are living together with other families. So as, as you can see, the, the network of actors in, in, in this specific case uh, study of Guernica is very complex and uh, it's quite difficult to distinguish between uh, who, are, who is formal and who is informal. And in some way, we can see that we have the, the inhabitants uh, that supported by social movement and grassroots organization present in the, in, the, in the whole fight, the academia with this commission of urbanism we created, and the, the legal defense that supported them in the, in the cause. And on the other hand, we have the judicial authorities uh, that strictly condemned the, the, um, the, 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 this land invasion and, uh, and in some way uh, supported the gated community and criminalized the, the, what is the vulnerable part. And on the other hand, we have the government of Buenos Aires that was at the beginning negotiating with the inhabitants, but that finally broke the negotiation and allowed the eviction. So in some way, uh, just in uh, order to conclude- Francesca, could you yeah. wrap up? Yes. Um, in order to conclude, um, I just want to say that starting from this, uh, this uh, empirical case, uh, we, can, we can recognize some interesting insights. Uh, firstly, the collective action and the agency of the popular sector in producing the peripheral city and then the, the synergy among the popular sectors, the social movements and academia in shaping the social and housing demand. Um, also, the, the important thing to state here is that uh, the peripheral land is uh, in conflict, is, in, is uh, contested uh, between the popular sector and the high class through these gated communities. And, um, and it's uh, quite interesting to, to look at the dynamics of this interaction between the autonomy of the, um, of the inhabitants and the uh, institutionalization and all the, uh, all the process of, um, of this negotiation. Uh, so I, I, I'm concluding and of course I'm happy to expand and uh, answer a question if, if there is any. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Francesca. A lot of uh, really interesting empirical insights from the three presentations. So in case some of you were wondering, we're supposed to have four presentations actually today, but our colleagues from UNTAR in Jakarta decided to withdraw their participation in this panel because they had some uh, difficulty gathering data over the last few weeks. So we just had uh, three presentations. Okay, uh, so we have uh, about 15 minutes for open discussion and I already saw one question in the chat box. But uh, before I take some feedback from our seed members and also questions, I'd like to invite our presenters to share their feedback if there's any or questions for their fellow presenters. So Ibrahim, Massa and Francisca, if uh, you have some questions to you want to clarify or some points you want to share about the presentation of your fellow presenters. Um, I just want to say uh, some observation that uh, it was really interesting to see that this kind of 
uh, the theme of land tenure issues in different contexts and how that plays, uh, um, take, takes different positions actually. But uh, it's really interesting from what uh, Francesca uh, presented, that your case is amazing. It, it's, it's really interesting in terms of the land issues. And uh, I, I think that uh, it's really interesting when, when I compare it with my case that uh, the um, the, when we have a developer that uh, they agree to contribute uh, the land through the uh, corporate social responsibility uh, strategies and so on. And then uh, we have a government that uh, have the political will to support the people, uh, how uh, the, those uh, kind of land acquisition for infrastructure can be facilitated during, during the project. And then uh, the political will doesn't exist and there is no support from the government. Uh, there are examples of what, uh, what has happened in Buenos Aires and elsewhere in the world. So it was really interesting. Thank you for the presentation, both you and Ibrahim. Thanks, Masa. Did uh, Francesca or Ibrahim want to respond or provide any feedback? Otherwise, I'll be starting to collect some questions and feedback from our seed participants. Yeah, maybe just reflecting on the fact that uh, this uh, case of Guernica in some way shows uh, what is the beginning of uh, an occupation and uh, what is a future neighbor possibly if there is no eviction. I mean, I mean the, in Buenos Aires metropolitan area, the Tomas de Tierra, this land invasion, uh, were a way of creating the city. Um, so I think it's interesting contrasting with Masha presentation mm -hmm. that it, there she's uh, looking at a neighborhood um, uh, that already has a, a history and you're looking at the difficulties and uh, the, the challenges of acceding to, to have access to infrastructure. So it's interesting to reflect in this, uh, in this um, what is the future of a land invasion? Thanks, Francesca. Okay, so uh, we have actually some reactors from the seed members. So I'm going to call them, but before that, because Andrew had to leave, Andrew is also one of the reactors to Ibrahim. So he had a question logged in and I would just read it out. Ibrahim, thanks for your insightful presentation. It seems to me that both of your cases are closely addressing the delay of the original planning schemes, the fulfillment of Ward J development and the possibility of infrastructure extension. In this sense, possibly it was not that the imam or the residents did not want to be relocated or be resettled, but rather the issue that the government did not keep its promise or realize its capability to fulfill the development. If this is the case, then the problem is more relevant to the process of implementation rather than the context of planning schemes, segregation by design. My question to you is that whether such an issue is still existing today, even after the colonial era. So just to provide a context, uh, Andrew is doing his PhD at uh, Washington University in St. Louis in uh, Missouri, USA, and he's also conducting some research in Ghana. So he's more or less familiar with the planning regime in Ghana. So Ibrahim, did you wanna respond to that question? Yes, yes. Um, I will say that um, it's, it's, it's a combination of both. The, uh, the protest and the resistance that was, that the, 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 the people coordinated and um, I mean, put across to the colonial authority help to um, delay their relocation. And then the fact that the colonial authority also could not plan what J um, also uh, uh, helped to, uh, uh, I mean, keep the, the word, word D, to keep it alive. But um, immediately after um, independence, after, after colonial, the colonial administration left, the post-colonial government actually took steps to um, relocate, to relocate the residents out of the place. So um, as we speak, 
the world has been replanted and then the uh, lands were allocated for um, commercial development and then businesses were able to acquire plots in the and then uh, uh, rebuilt. The people were also uh, relocated. But the thing is that um, the, way, the way the colonial plans were prepared and implemented and the insurgents or protest and uh, the, the, the attitude of pro protesting planning decisions has more or less become a norm such that um, first because of the incremental nature of plan preparation in the area they like i was saying they, they, there seem to be no integration between the settlements the neighborhoods the the, the, the indigenous neighborhoods so today you will find that governments want to inject roads into this, those areas, but they need to, I mean, demolish and create access roads. And they need to demolish houses to be able to do that. Because of that, people always come out. They feel like it is a right to protest against any planning decision which will have to relocate them from their original places. So my point is that the original insurgent practices during, during colonialism has uh, fed into current uh, uh, city where any planned intervention in any of the low income areas leads to widespread uh, widespread uh, protestation even though they, they 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 have succeeded the colonial i mean the post colonial government succeeded in relocating the residents yeah. from the area thanks ibrahim i think the roosters have questions as well it's early in the morning there but uh, i think we also have some feedback and questions from, we'll probably take it as a one round of questions and feedback from Eric, who's also from Ghana, and uh, Kyra. Then uh, we'll go to Roro. So those three questions and feedback, then we'll ask our presenters to respond. Eric? Great, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Redin, for the opportunity. And um, good to see you, Ibrahim, and to hear your presentation. Um, I mean, your presentation really um, brings my mind to, you know, some of the research that I've done, especially on the, on the southern, southern Ghana. Uh, you realize that, um, as you have mentioned, um, colonial frameworks and colonial approaches to planning has been something that has been, is still embedded in the, in the planning um, um, regimes or the planning context that we have in Ghana. And to be able to bring out the cases, especially from the northern aspect, where um, most of these um, researchers on, on colonial planning would normally not be focusing on because they felt that you know there was so much interaction at the look at the southern part of Ghana. I think it's it's a very um, interesting um, ideas that you have brought up. Um, I have just um, I should say two questions. Um, one of them, which you have already. Um, you know, explained part of it through your, your, your response to Andrew's question. It basically has to do with, you know, um, how current governments, you know, are able to navigate through this politics um, within the local areas, you know, to be able to put in some um, services and infrastructure. For instance, you, you would recall that, um, you know, the housing project that was introduced by um, the Kufo government about uh, some years ago, it's something that was a very major project and that probably might have affected a lot of um, the already existing areas in, in those areas. How, how are governments able to be able to navigate within those areas? And then the case that you also brought up really brought in the role of, you know, religion, the role of traditional customs, you know, to be able to um, deal with some of these planning um, programs or planning projects that are made. Um, do you still see this as these two institutions, religions and traditional authorities to be um, strongly embedded within the planning process in Ghana? Or, and if you see that, um, what has been the changes to how they are able to approach? I mean, the way that they, you know, when, when you consider the fact that previously they were dealing with a foreign power, right? people that are outsiders, I should say. And now they are dealing with mostly insiders, people that are part of them, but of course, within the uh, former governmental interventions. Do you feel that there have been any changes in the way they approach and um, 
if so what 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 are the kind of changes that we see thank you yeah thanks eric uh kyra uh congratulations to all our presenters for really wonderful um uh, presentations uh for ibrahim um i really like how you framed your discussion around the issue of inclusion and i think it's one of the buzzwords in urban governance at, at the moment and uh, i like the way that you highlight uh social cultural and political issues uh in relation to colonial history so th these are things that uh, don't normally find their way into these discussions about urban planning and, and uh, uh, and all these things, especially in terms of the exclusionary practices that are rooted in these colonial histories. And I know you uh, perhaps ha had uh, less time to talk about uh, the implications on present day. So I would, I would like to maybe give you a, a little bit of space to discuss more on that. You talked about it a little bit earlier, but I would like to highlight perhaps um, just three questions, uh, all interrelated. Uh, one would be what would you say characterizes urban uh, development in present day Tamale in relation to the colonial history that you have talked about? And I ask this in, in particular in terms of uh, how do you unpack the, the tensions and contestations that you talked about, you, you said about the, you know, people are uh, protesting about relocation and all these kinds of uh, development interventions. So I was wondering if you could unpack a little these tensions and contestations from colonial planning practices and post-colonial planning practices and their implications on present day and then what might be the discernible impacts on uh, social spatial relations of people uh, in these settlements uh, and lastly i'd like to pick up on uh, one of the problems that you raised uh, about is it really only about the fragmented planning strategy that is problematic or is there something as well about the colonial and post-colonial logics, rationalities and ethics of designing um, uh, urban spaces? Thanks. Thank you, Kyra. And for this la uh, round, uh, Roro. Um, thank you, Redin. Uh, actually, my question uh, I will address to Masa, is that right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so Masa, thank you for the uh, interesting um, presentation. Uh, I just probably, I just want to probably elaborate more on uh, the program itself, especially related to the government. Is, does this uh, improvement, like, is, is it part of the local government's initiative for land upgrading program or is it something that is proposed by a uh, third party? Because it's it's actually in Indonesia, it's not really common for local government to upgrade the land. They usually just drive it out. So if, it's, uh, if it comes from them, then it's something that we can appreciate. Uh, but then how it will be implemented, that's another thing. Like. Uh, will it be like a top-down decision with like a selected design, pre-designed thing, and then the, the people will just accept it? Or will there be any participatory uh, in the process? And also, um, uh, for the second question, I'm wondering, is there any uh, resistance from the people that leads to vertical conflict, probably? Um, because usually... I, I don't know, probably Indonesian people who live in informal settlement usually have already had this kind of, not animosity, but kind of like they don't like government people, you know, like they have like this suspicion kind of thing. So how how do you think the people will accept this plan and how it would be different from Makassar to other projects that you're handling in Fiji? And I, I can't remember where else. I think that's my question. Thank you. Thanks, Roro. So we also have a lot of questions for uh, Francesca, but we'll get to them after we hear the responses from Ibrahim and Masa. So, Ibrahim? Yes, um, thank you very much for the, uh, is it Eric? Eric for the, the first uh, uh, the question. Um, what I can say regarding current government, how current government is able to navigate uh, through the, 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 the uh, or current contemporary governments are able to navigate through the 
a process of planning or whatever. What I would say is that, um, you know, now um, the land tenure system is such that um, traditional authority now have ownership of land. They, they have ownership and control over land. And then the government has the planning power to decide how land is to be used. That alone is, is conflicting because often the traditional authority um, have the way they want the, 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 the land. They want as much as possible to be able to profit from uh, uh, the lands that they have. And then if plans are prepared, what I see is that it's very difficult for government to get plans implemented the way they are planned. Because if you make provision for, say, the provision of infrastructure, um, markets, schools, and all of those areas, uh, if you don't pay the traditional authorities the right compensation, they, they, they will encroach on the land and then replant the area and use it for the purpose for which. So the, the essence of planning would have been lost. And that is currently the problems that we have in, in Ghana, where, where plans are prepared by, by the states in collaboration with traditional authority. But what, um, in terms of plan implementation, it's always very difficult to go through because uh, chiefs or traditional authorities are those who have control over the land. And because they usually chiefs go and chiefs come. And so when a new chief comes and then an area hasn't been uh, uh, very well developed, he goes, he decides to go in there to replant the area for, uh, uh, to be able to profit largely from it. So that's the nature, the complex nature of the land tenure problem in, in, in Ghana. And I, I think, um, uh, I, I don't know whether that answers Eric's question, but um, uh, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that, that we have a complex land tenure uh, system in Ghana, making it very difficult for government to be able to navigate their way through and be able to get plans prepared and implemented. Then, um, yeah. Then, then regarding the implications for uh, current planning approaches, um, like I mentioned before, is the fragmented nature of colonial planning itself created, uh, I mean, not well integrated settlements. And so it is difficult to inject infrastructure without having to demolish people's uh, homes. But one thing that I noticed that from the colonial times, the, the state was very powerful and it had control over land. At, that time, at the time of colonialism, all Northern lands were vested in the colonial states. So they decided how they wanted to plan and they had the resources. So they could easily plan an area and then compensate people to be able to move and relocate. But today, the, the you know, current planning decisions which require relocating people they always try to seek explanation using colonial times. So they will say, for example, that um, these people are sitting on a road and that uh, they, their forefathers collected compensation from the states at the time of colonialism and refused to relocate from the area. So, and then, you know, the last case that I presented showed where the colonial powers roots uh, I mean, informing chiefs in the area that this particular area, the way they have built, is not consistent with the plan. And when, if the town expands to, to engulf that, those areas, what will happen will be that we will uh, demolish those houses without compensation. So because the current local government, I mean, local government is, uh, is not that resourceful, they rely, they try to rely on those type of uh, letters and then move into areas tell them if they want to, because they cannot pay compensation. So what they do is to just exploit those, uh, 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 I mean, past situations where they are, they are convinced that the current generation of residents do not understand what persisted, what existed in the past. They will use documents to say that, you know, uh, uh, your forefathers got compensation from the state. And so they will go in there to demolish the houses. So for example, you have now um, the local government using, um, I mean, representatives, local government representatives in Ghana, we call them the uh, assembly members. The assembly members will go onto the ground and then use, mobilize community 
to uh, let them understand that, I mean, if you get access roads, it brings about a lot of development in the area. And so they will kind of incite the people, incite the local people themselves to go to the local assembly and demand for, say, the injection of roads into their area. When it happens like that, those who become who who become victims of, I mean, housing demolitions, uh, uh, lose their voice because now their own people are against them. So this is what's happening today, and it's all because of the way in which planning was okay. practiced in the past, and then uh, uh, the, the the fact that current governments are just exploiting, taking advantage of uh, the fact that people don't have the information. And, uh, uh, and they don't also have the resources to be able to appropriately compensate people. So they exploit this situation and then be able to yeah. pull down houses okay. and then leave people less include, uh, included yeah. in the city. Uh, Ibrahim, sorry, I might have to cut you off there because we also want to get to other questions. Uh, have you already responded to Kyra's uh, questions? Probably quickly, yes. then we can move on to Masses yes, it is, it is the, the second question about um, whether the impact of colonial planning, whether um, it still persists and which forms that it, uh, it manifests was what I was responding to. The fact that, okay. um, yeah. uh -huh, yes, that, that was yeah. also, so I, I, I believe I kind of uh, responded yeah. to. Thank that, you. That yeah. So uh, Masa, do you want to respond to Roro? Then we'll have another round of questions for Francesca this time. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, thanks, Roro, for asking uh, the questions. Uh, about your first question about the uh, project, I should say that uh, this project is currently uh, supported um, through the uh, financial uh, support of ADB, Asian Development Bank, and also Monash University. So it's kind of a collaboration between different, different organizations with the local government. Uh, but the aim is that uh, if, if we can prove that the evidence of this approach uh, um, shows the success, then uh, we can think about the scaling out processes and scaling up uh, this approach uh, to impact more people and, um, and maybe institutionalize this uh, into the local government. And um, uh, the, the, the good thing for, the, for Mukasa at the moment is that uh, the political will from the local government is uh, um, in uh, kind of agreement with this sort of approach to upgrading project. And um, I'm not sure if any changes in the political will um, how, how actually the changes in the political will of the, go uh, the, the, uh, the government can impact the um, scaling out processes in the future. But um, uh, the, the other question about the Fiji, I should say that um, the settlement in the Fiji has a, a really different um, um, condition in terms of the tenure arrangements. Most of those settlements are under customary uh, land tenure arrangements. And for example, uh, each settlements, all of the households can be, uh, can have um, um, uh, a lease, a community lease agreement for the whole area. So um, the, the dynamics for land contribution is totally different, but uh, I had to uh, just decide between both countries, uh, which one I want to focus. And uh, I think that uh, the, the land uh, situation in Indonesia is more diverse, so it's more interesting in terms of the research. And uh, finally, um, in terms of the resistance from people, uh, yeah, this, this is true. Uh, people are really protective uh, about the land contribution. And uh, well, it, it, it actually makes sense because the land is uh, the only asset that they have. So, uh, um, but um, the negotiations over the land contribution uh, in the RISE project has been under a very uh, carefully designed code, is, uh, carefully designed uh, participation and community engagement processes. Uh, so, um, 
um, uh, there, there are so many considerations in terms of how we approach people, how we communicate this with them, and how to clarify every aspect of uh, the land contribution. And actually, these um, alternative tenure arrangements are um, helping in this situation in order to let people to safeguard their rights and at the same time uh, receive the infrastructure. So um, I'm not sure if I covered all of your questions, but um, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Masa. Uh, guys, because we are out of time, so for this last round, I'll just be taking three questions. And uh, that would be from Parul, PB, and uh, Alex. Sorry, guys. Uh, we'll have more discussions probably early next year, so we'll have more conversations around this informal settlement issues as well. So Parul, could you quickly read out your question for Francesca? Thanks, Rada. And thank you, Francesca, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, so my question was, uh, it is often uh, seen in the peri peripheral areas that the service providers, there is a confusion between the service providers and the inhabitants of those areas in terms of service delivery. So people don't know that which are the right agencies to approach for getting service in their area because agencies respond in a confused manner. So how can we as researchers and urban designers tackle to this problem? So what is the future way forward? Okay, thanks Parul. Uh, is PV still here? Otherwise, I'll just read out her question for Francesca. Francesca, I really enjoyed your presentation. What a fascinating research. The questions I had were about the group of inhabitants, as you often referred to the collective actions they did. You describe how they resist, prevent eviction, but also produce informal settlements together. How were the social and political dynamics within the group of inhabitants? Were their internal political dynamics different than the state? If so, would, they, would you describe their actions as prefigurative? Were they intentionally building alternative proposals beyond the actions of the state? And how can we think about this through an intersectional lens? Again, thanks so much for your presentation. So, Francesca? Okay. So, um, um, I will answer to Parul. Um, well, actually, the the problem in uh, with the um, water and sanitation and electricity uh, services in Argentina is not related to jurisdictional boundaries because uh, the um, the companies um, are works in a, in, a, in at the metropolitan scales and uh, the inhabitants uh, recognize exactly what is the company that have to uh, extend the, um, the network. Um, so there is no confusion in if what is the company that have to extend the, 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 the network in informal settlements. The problem is related to the aband aband abandonment and to uh, the, the fact that in informal settlements in peripheral areas, the state does not intervene and the access to services end up being informally produced by the, by the same dwellers. And, and so it's, uh, it's a question of abandonment and, and the state not intervening, I would say. And uh, relating to the second question, which, which is quite difficult, um, but really interesting, uh, of course, the disoccupation started in a, in a spontaneous way at the beginning with the first group of people in, invading the land and then pro progressively reached the 2000 family uh, and they started to organize themselves through an as assembly where they defined during the, this, uh, uh, this uh, mechanism of, uh, of votation collectively they decided how to plot the land, how to distribute each plot to the families, how to organize the neighborhood living uh, as uh, places for public pub, uh, public areas, 
And, uh, and of course, it was highly political because the grassroots organization supported the inhabitants and also helped them to organize the fight and the struggle and the political protest. And, and I, I do think that this Kernika case study uh, uh, shows this prefigurative politics, as you say, because they, they were t all the time thinking about the future. They were all the time thinking about a different way of producing the city. So I think you, you stated a very interesting uh, uh, question to, to issue to, to reflect. Uh, thank you, Francesca. And uh, guys, thanks for all your wonderful questions. And sorry for those uh, who ask questions, who log in their feedback there, and we just don't have time to read them out. Uh, and before we close, just one final announcement. Next Friday, we'll have our second and final panel session. That's on December 4 at 1 p.m. Melbourne time. We will have four presentations talking about intersecting informalities, which will be chaired by my colleague, Tansil Shafiq. So again, uh, thank you so much to our speakers and to the participants who join us today. We look forward to seeing you all next week. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.